Awesome. Well, Quinn uh, showed me. He showed me one. He saw me in the hall. And I, he was like, "Got something to show you." I'm like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. So. A uh, couple things. Um, before I pass out homework six, um, I want everybody to be clear on the schedule. I'm going to make it a, a habit to have this on every slide from here on out. So this is our homework schedule for the rest of the semester. And as far as I know, we should maintain it. We're, we're going to be good on time and coverage of topics. So you all have homework seven in hand right now. It is due on the 14th. Now, because I'm aware that when you're using the alignment charts, you have a tendency to maybe to draw a line on it, and between all the examples we've done in class and what have you, it might be kind of covered and, and tough to interpret. So if you go on to, uh, or if you go to the huddle station right outside my office, I got a big pile of them. So if you want to grab a couple, that's fine. So, and, and when we have the exam, I'll have a fresh one on the exam for you. So, sound good? You you don't have to, no. But I'm just saying if you have you know, inadvertently done so during class or, or for, let's say, for problem one. Because problem one, you have to do like six of them. So, you know, you, I wanted to make sure you had extras. Sound good? Okay, so again, from here on out, homework is going to be assigned each Friday and due each Friday uh, to sort of uh, uh, get through our topics. I could combine homeworks eight and nine into a single beam homework, but that would be a really big homework. So... Yes? Not quite. Not quite, not quite. I just needed to turn. So. It's starting to get warm again is what it is. So. I could go the other way, right? I could go the other way, get the long hair again. I don't have the discipline to do that again, so that's the issue. Right. What's that? It was rough. <laughs> it was rough. Oh, you mean when you grew yours up? When you grew yours up? No, yeah, I, I totally, I, I could totally get along with it. See, for me, when my hair grew out, it was very, very straight. So when it got right here in my eyes, that was, that was the tough spot. Mr. Chadwick. Let's see. Miss Clark. Mr. Conley. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like smacking you in the face with it. Oh, didn't mean for that to happen. Mr. Mays. Mr. Mitchell. That's all I know. Mr. Morris. Mr. Schaffer. We were all talking about No, no. It's, if you look at if you look at the symbols, there's one that matches where it's allowed to translate, but free to or but, but, uh, it's allowed to translate, but it's fixed from rotation. Yeah. The one thing I do want to show you all a little bit on this homework is problem one. I do want to spend some time on that because there, I know there were some, some odd plots. First off, your plot should have looked like this, okay? It should have had this sort of shape to it. And, and in terms of constructing the plot, uh, a couple of things. Number one, okay, if you go to your handouts, and go to, I think it's column handout two. I think it's this one. Yeah. And you look, like, right on the first page. I mean, there's your equations right there. So they were actually, I mean, it's, it's literally right there. Um, the only thing that this uh, does not have is phi. You have to adjust it by 0.9. Um, so let me show you how I did this. Um, what I did is I have KL over R from 0 to 200 right here. And I have... Uh, an elastic or my oil or buckling capacity calculation. Now at KL over R equals zero, you're dividing by zero, so it's essentially infinity. But it doesn't really matter. 
which means your F critical is 36. Um, but the big thing I want to show you is this, is this formula right here. So here's what this formula is saying. It's basically one big if-then statement. It's saying if your KL over R is less than or equal to 4.71 times the square root of 29,000 divided by FY, whatever FY is, then your capacity is 0.658 raised to the quantity FY over FE times FY, or it's 0.877 times FE. And, and that's it. And then just boop, copy and paste, just to make sure, make sure that you know, when you do that, you're locking in your FY, because that doesn't change. That's always 36. Or you can have a column just full of 36s. That wouldn't matter. Now, what that will give you is F critical. The F critical, you've got to multiply it by 0.9. So when it's all said and done, you should have a plot that looks something like that, and that's essentially it. So uh, that one, I think, with a little bit of Excel creativity was, was pretty straightforward. The advantage of, of doing it like this is if I go through and say, well, my yield stress is 42, the curve changes accordingly. You know, so. Okay. Now for the rest of the solution, um, Let's see, so I think the big thing was just A, making sure you're getting the right uh, uh, lookup values. Um, let's see, I think your KL over R for problem two ended up governing in the x-axis. It was about 110.3. That was your KL over R. So when you calculate your um, capacity using E3, you compare KL over R to uh, 4.71 times the square root of E over Fy, and it is just, just on the other side of that. So you're still using your 0.658. You should get a capacity of around 266 kips. Now, if you use table 4.1, you end up getting 265.5. And that, again, that just comes from interpolation, just the fact that you're assuming it's a straight line. Again, you're assuming it's a straight line when you do interpolation, but it's not. You know, that's obviously not a straight line. Okay. So, make sense? Okay. Now, on problem three, um, a couple things. So, uh, here were my trial sections. I chose a uh, 14 by 82, a 12 by 72, and a 10 by 88. Technically, I could have chosen the, the 10 by 77, but I think when you actually go through and choose that, it's, I think you can look at it and see that's probably a close call since its capacity is, in fact, exactly 720. So when you do your interpolation, you can probably make a guess and say it's not going to work. But um, I want to show you something. So. Let's take a look at this. So your KL in the X direction is 36 feet, and your KL in the Y direction is 15 feet. Now, if you take each section one at a time, uh, let's take the 14 by 82. So your RX over RY is 2.44. So if you calculate your KL effective, you get 14.75. Now, that value is less than this. Okay, And because it's less than this, you know that your weak axis governs, and whatever you looked up in that table is in fact the capacity. So I can tell you right now, without doing any more work, the W14 by 82 will work. It will be a, a, a um, it will be one that works. Now, because the W14 by 82 works, I didn't even waste my time doing the W10 by 88. Because if the W14 by 82 works, why would I work check one that's heavier? It'd just be wasting my time because I know this one works. So my efforts from here on out are going to be on the W12 by 72. Now when I uh, divide by RX or RY, I get 20.57. If you compare that against this, it tells you that the strong axis governs. So that means you need to do a little bit of interpolation. But when you look at the interpolation that you would do, you would be interpolating between, it's what, 20.57? So you got to look up the value for 20. And since there's no value for 21, you've got to look up the value for 22. So you'd be interpolating somewhere between 602 and 547. And whatever the value is between 602 and 547, it's less than 720. So you don't need to do the interpolation here either. So the W14 by 82 works. The W12 by 72 doesn't work. And I didn't waste my time doing this one because it's heavier than that one. So my answer is the W14 by 82. Yes? So how did you determine the K values on those? Okay. Let me see. Uh, 
was it this one? Actually, I think it was this one. Let me see. Nope, it wasn't this one. It was this one. Okay. All right. The different. All right. First off, I, I, I can see where there would be some mix-ups there. I was trying to match the symbols that were on the homework exactly to the symbols that were in the, uh, the manual. So if you notice, like that one column, it doesn't have. It's not fixed. It has that block. Okay. Do y'all see what I'm talking about? Okay. The difference between, like, if you look at column A versus column C, and actually, you know what? Let me pull it up in the slideshow because it's a little pixelated here. Was it slide 276? Okay. Here we go. The difference between, let's look at the difference between A and C. So if you notice, A is fixed, fixed, and C is kind of fixed, fixed. The difference between this boundary condition and this boundary condition is this boundary condition is allowed to move. It's not allowed to rotate, but it's allowed to move. See, I was using these in condition codes right here to draft out those symbols. Okay, so if you have a column that's fixed on the bottom, but uh, the boundary condition on the top is fixed against rotation, but free to translate. That would be KC, and your K value would be 1.2. Does that make sense? Ah, uh, a moment frame, or something like a moment frame. Because a moment frame, I mean, that, I mean, what's the difference between a brace frame and a moment frame? A moment frame is allowed this way. But you are correct. If you were, it, let me say this: if you were actually doing a moment frame, you would probably end up using the alignment chart anyways. But um, to sort of, I guess, add a little bit of reality to it, when we did a lot of moment frame problems, we were getting, I mean. We were getting K values like 1.2 and what have you. In fact, when you do your homework assignment, you probably are going to get K values around 1.2 for some of those columns. So. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Again, I apologize if it was a little unclear. I tried to do my best to, I mean, literally, like if you look, like I'm literally using the same symbol, you know, like, like line for line to try and match it. So. Everybody okay? All right. Um, let me see. Does everybody have a copy of Homework 7? Because I still got some copies over here if you haven't grabbed them. Those are due Friday. So. Okay. All right. Now, what slide was I on? It was on like something like this. Something like this. Okay, um, then let's get into the world of beams. Now, if you recall from last time, let me, let me go back a little bit. I showed you all the greatest slide ever, and I'm going to show you again. Yeah, so if you recall, if you have a beam and you apply some moment to it, it starts off behaving elastically, okay? And it will behave elastically until you reach the yield stress at uh, either the top or the bottom of the section, assuming it's symmetric. Now, in mechanics of deformable bodies, that's where we essentially assumed that everything stopped. You know, once you reach some limiting stress at the extreme fibers, you're done. But in reality, that's not the maximum moment that a beam can withstand. Now, if you keep applying moment to this, what happens is, well, the very top and the very bottom have yielded, but that doesn't mean that this is yielded or that's yielded or any of these points in the middle. So once you keep applying moment, that yielding penetrates throughout the section to the point where you've yielded the entire cross section, and that's the point that matters. We call that the plastic, uh, plastic moment. I, uh, I, I, any excuse I have to show that slide again, I will, because that slide's awesome. Oh, whoops, sorry. And you do need the sign-in sheet. Okay. So, sign-in sheet and solutions to homework six. Be messed up if one day I just said, you know what, no. <laughs> no.
say, you're on your own. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, that's true. You can sit there and just pause the video. You can do it. Okay. All right. Let's get to it. Okay, so last time we did an, ex uh, an example discussing classic moment and a new section property that we discovered called ZX, okay? And ZX is essentially, um, it's a little bit different than, you know, something like a, a section modulus. You know, elastic section properties and whatnot are defined based off the, the neutral axis or where the centroid is, whereas plastic section properties are more about where the area above a given line equals the area below because we're talking about compression equals tension and they're not necessarily in the same spot. If you go through and do the math you'll find that in many cases the location of the centroid and the location of the plastic neutral axis are in two different spots and, and I even mentioned this in tension members a while back. I said, you know, we have Y bar and we have Y sub P and I was like, when we were doing tension members, I said, don't use the Y sub P. Well, now you know why because they're referring to different, uh, different um, properties. And we did an example, something about like this, uh, where we uh, computed the, uh, where the location of the PNA, ZX, and ultimately the plastic moment. Now, if you go through and compute the centroid of this section, what do we get? We got like five inches, like up here, like that was this uh, plastic neutral axis. Was it five? Yep. Yeah. If you do the centroid, you know, sum of AY over sum of A, it doesn't come out to be 5 inches. It's something like 7.5, 7.6, something like that. Because as you start yielding throughout the section, that neutral axis has to shift in order to maintain equilibrium. Okay. So far so good? Okay. So now let's talk about beams. Let's talk about how to actually portion them, analyze them, design them. Um, in order to... Uh, to do this, I mean, this is going to be a discussion that we have for the rest of the semester. We're going to start off making an assumption that LB equals zero. Okay? Now, what's LB? Well, we mentioned this last time. LB is essentially the distance between bracing elements for a given beam. Okay? So, uh, like with you have a column that was like, what, 30 foot long, but we really didn't care about the overall length of the column when we were determining capacity. We care about the distance between unbraced segments, or the distance between bracing elements. So if we had a 30-foot long column, but there were simple braces every 10 feet, well, when we computed capacity, we just said the L was 10 feet. We didn't say it was 30, right? Same thing is true with, uh, with beams. I think that it might be a little more confusing with beams because when you compute the forces, you know, the moments, WL squared over eight, you're using the whole span length, but you might not be using that for the unbraced. So it's just something you got to make sure that you're, you're paying attention to. <coughs> now, some examples of lateral bracing. Now, what I mean by lateral bracing is lateral bracing is trying to prevent a beam from moving, you know, to the left or right. So there's a couple examples of that. One of them might be something like this. If you have a composite slab, and, you know, you've got some of that shear studs welded to the top flange, and then that slab is locked in uh, with that beam, then that beam cannot move to the left or right at all. So um, the way that we would uh, describe this is we would describe this beam as having continuous lateral support. So LB is the distance between braces. What we would say for a beam like this is that if, because it is continuously braced, we'd be saying LB is zero. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now, uh, here's another example of lateral bracing. If you've got a floor system and you just have beams framing into one another, so, for instance, if I was looking at, you know, like, let's say this girder, you know, the span length of the girder might be something like 30 feet, but the unbraced length, the LB, might only be 10 feet because it might only be 10 feet from this beam to this beam. And those beams are preventing that girder from moving to the left or right. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, <coughs> another uh, uh, example... More common in bridge applications is the use of a cross frame. So, for instance, you know, you have some of these girders. You know, some of these girders might be, you know, 100 feet long or so. Like that girder there on the right might be a couple hundred feet long. 
but the unbraced length, the L sub B, might only be something like 20, 25 feet because that's the distance between those, those, those braces. Those look like, you know, inverted K frames or something like that on the image on the left, just uh, X braces uh, and what have you. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about this? This isn't too bad, right? The big thing is I just want you to understand the difference between how long a girder is and the distance between its braces, okay? And like I said, for the first component of this uh, beam design stuff, we're going to assume LB is zero, okay? And the reason why we're making that assumption is because we're assuming that there's no buckling going on. We're going to assume no buckling now, and then later we're going to ask, well, how, what if we did have to account for buckling, which is the case in, in a number of scenarios, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go into that. Okay. Everybody good so far? Okay. Now, if I'm designing a beam, I, I really have three things to consider. And I think those of you in concrete design or who have already had concrete design could probably spit this stuff out by now. If you're designing beams, we really have three things that we need to consider from a design standpoint. We have moment, we have shear, and we have deflections, right? I mean, when we design beams, that's essentially what we care about, that we had adequate moment strength, we had adequate shear strength, and that we had adequate uh, serviceability uh, considerations uh, met. Sound good? Now, uh, let me just say something real quick on shear, okay? Now, if you're designing something like a plate girder, let's say a plate girder in a, in a bridge, and you've got like a really, really thin web on that girder. Well, in that scenario, shear becomes a much bigger deal. And the design uh, for shear is somewhat analogous to what we did in concrete design for stirrups. You know, instead of laying out a hooped rebar, you know, piece of stirrup, we're laying out stiffeners. You all have probably uh, driven down the road and seen a, maybe like an older steel bridge, and they've got those vertical plates on the, on the, uh, on the web of the girder. That's what those vertical plates are doing. They're there to help the girder's capacity in shear. Um, but, uh, I'll say for beam considerations, that's pretty rare. Um, the way that we roll eye shapes, you know, the, the W30 by 90s and the W27 by 94s, et cetera, the webs come out pretty stocky. And for lack of a better term, you're going to find shear capacity, not really a big issue. We're going to see problems where uh, we'll have, a, let's say, 20 kips in shear and 120 kips in capacity. I mean, it's, sheer, it's just going to blow it out of the water. Really, what's going to govern our design is going to be flexion uh, or moment, uh, or, or moment and deflection, I guess I should say. Now, if you go to uh, the spec, remember Chapter D is on tension members and Chapter E was on compression members. Y'all remember that? Well, Chapter F is going to be on, B, on flexure. Chapter G is going to be on shear, and Chapter L is going to be on deflections. We're really not going to actually look very much at Chapter L, but that will become clear here in a second. Now, speaking of the manual, let's talk about some tabs. If you'll notice in this class, I never gave you all a beam design aid. I gave it to you in concrete design, but not in here. The reason why is it's in the manual. Okay, So if you open your manual, now I'm, I'm, uh, this is page 3-something, so I'm in the the front matter of the manual, uh, if you go on to those gold tabs, the one that says beam, uh, and I'm in pretty much the last uh, chunk of that section on 3-213, you'll notice a, a table that says table 3-23, shears, moments, and deflections. And there's dozens of different um, scenarios and uh, loading considerations, like for instance, uh, uh, case one, a simple beam, uniformly distributed load, arguably the most common instance of a, uh, of a beam loading that we see uh, in, in practice. So you know, maximum moment, WL squared over 8 at mid-span, maximum shear, WL over 2, maximum deflection, 5WL to the 4th over 3, 4EI. Those of you that are in concrete design right now, that stuff's got to be pretty familiar. You know, so, um, so now you know where that is. So uh, the only thing I would, I would just... Um, one thing I would pay attention to is just make sure that um, make sure you're paying attention to the to the and the variables going into it. Like if you're doing something with triangular loads, just make sure that you're using the right units and the right input to get the uh, the values that you're interested in. But other than that, this is a pretty straightforward guide and a really really useful one. Sound good? Now. 
One thing I'll go about or go on real quick about, um, if you remember uh, with columns, concept of local planning, maybe the, bless you, the idea is that instead of the whole column buckling, maybe it's just the plan that buckles, or maybe it's just the web that buckles. And you remember the way that we would check that is we would compare the slenderness, you know, the BF over TTF and the H over TW against certain limits. Well, it's the same thing with beams. Uh, the limits are a little more intricate, but for our purposes, it, it, it doesn't really matter, and I'll explain why. Um, beams, because of their, their behavior, um, instead of splitting them up into two categories, we split them up into three. So if you remember with columns, we either said that the elements are going to buckle or they're not going to buckle. And we would compare that against like a 0.56 square root of E over FY or a 1.49 square root of e FY. With beams, um, we're a little more intricate with it. We say either beams aren't going to buckle locally, they're going to buckle locally in an inelastic fashion, or they're going to buckle locally in an elastic fashion. Really, for our purposes, I don't think it really uh, matters because the long and short of it is this. If you go to 16.1-16, so I want everybody to go to that. You should have that tabbed already if you haven't already tabbed it. Um, so that's this table right here, 16.1-16. Want everybody to turn to that. That one should be tapped. I hope it's tapped. They do not tab it. Hopefully All right, 16.1-16. Okay. Now, if you look over here on the left, the table on the left should be very familiar. Do you all recognize this? That's the one for columns, right? Well, well, by golly gosh, do you look at the one on the right? The one on the right is for beams. Okay. You'll notice there's two limiting ratios, lambda sub p and lambda sub r. For our purposes in this class, we're only going to care about lambda sub p. And more often than not, all of our beams are going to meet these requirements. You will find some beams that don't meet these requirements. In other words, we do have local buckling considerations. Fortunately, a lot of the design guides we use uh, take this into account. I want you all to at least check these on, on your homework problems, but it really shouldn't be a, a, a major concern. Sound good? Don't worry, we'll have some practice going into this. Sound good? Okay, now, if we are talking about a continuous braced beam, in other words, a beam where buckling isn't going to occur, then I propose that the capacity is just MP. It's plastic moment, right? Now, how do we compute MP? We take FY and we multiply it by its ZX, right? It's plastic section modules. Everybody okay with that? So, here's the capacity of beam and bending that isn't going to buckle, FYZX. The phi value is 0.9, and this is going to be our capacity expression for the first beam component of this class, FYZX. All right. Um, now, just real quick on units, when you calculate this out, FY is in what, KSI, ZX is in cubic inches, so when you compute your moment, it's going to be in inch kips, right? So you need to make sure and divide by 12 to get foot kips. Sound good? All right. Now, um, I've, I've had you all tab a couple things just now. If there's one thing I really, really want you to tab, it's this. It's table 3-2. We will use table 3-2 for the rest of the semester. So, if you, so I want everybody to turn to table 3-2 right now. Okay, so uh, here... Whoop. It starts on 3-19, uh, but I, that isn't page 3-19. I think that's a page further into it, but it starts on page 3-19. That definitely needs to be tabbed. We will use that for the rest of the semester, okay? Now, if you'll notice, there's a lot of information here. Yes? What? Oh, I'm confused. 
that's fine if you, if you want to do that. Just, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to make sure you can find it. I was wondering if you were making a pun there or something. I'll just tell more pun jokes. Yeah, I'll just use more puns. Okay. Ow, now. Okay, I really want you all to pay attention to this table because there's a lot of stuff in this table, a lot of incredibly useful information in this table. Okay. First off, Okay, so this table, if you notice, it's, it's called the ZX tables because the shapes are organized by their ZX. Like if you notice, the ZX values are going down. Like that's how they're organized, okay? So that's point one. Point two, you'll notice it lists, was this, maybe if the mouse cursor was out of the way, it lists V and P, okay? This, now I moved the mouse. There we go. It lists V and P, so that's what this is. VMP. Now it's called VMPX because it's got the strong axis. That's all that means. Okay, so VMP is listing it for allowable stress and LRFD. Okay, now there's a couple of terms that you're not, you, you haven't been acquainted to yet. First off, VMR, you don't know what that is yet. We will get to it. You don't know what these beam factors are. We will get to that. Okay, uh, also LP and LR, we'll get to that later. These, these four terms are related to buckling, so but we, we will get to that. Okay, it also lists moment of inertia and just pop quick, what do you think the VBN is? Shear capacity. So for now, we're just going to look it up. We'll talk at the very end how to compute shear capacity. It's just not going to be a big deal. Yes? That is a, that is a wonderful question. Okay, and, and if I, I, am, I am actually asking you all this question. So, at the, the sections and notice how they're broken up into chunks like there's like maybe five members and then three members and then six members and then four members and they're broken up into like rows like six row chunks or five row chunks everybody see that and notice how within each chunk the top row is bolded why why is the top row bolded within a chunk it's the lightest Look right here on, on, uh, on this slide. Notice this is from page 3 dash, I think it's uh, 23. And if you notice, this chunk on the top is a 30 by 116, then 147, 131, 158, da da da. da. Of that group, that's the lightest. Okay? Okay. Look at this. Look at it. It's easier to see on 3-23. Turn, turn to 3-23. Okay. So start, start at the 30-116, right? Now notice, every single shape in this table is listed according to ZX. That's number one. So I went into Excel and I just sorted it by ZX. Okay? Now, Look what happens. So 116, then 147, 131, 158, 193, 210. As soon as you see a section that's lighter than the 116, there's a space. Do you see that? Then the next section is what? The W30 by 108? And then it keeps going. And then once you find a section that's lighter than the 108, you put a space. Then once you see a section that's lighter than the 30 by 99, you put a space. D does that make sense? It's tougher to see on the first page because you're dealing with these super heavy sections that they're all designed to be that economical shape. So it's just those bold rows. Does that make sense? All right. So in terms of economy, you know, you might be solving for a ZX and you might get a ZX, like you need a ZX of, you know, 365, but you're going to pick 378 because... If you went off 365, you'd be picking the W24 by 131. Well, why don't you pick that one? It's lighter. Let's hit on your wallet. Does that make sense? Okay with that? Okay. Whew. Allergies are getting close. Now, what the? There we go. Yeah, we're done with the class. <laughs> okay. A couple other things. All right. So 
We've got moment covered and we've got shear covered. For now, with shear, we're just going to look it up. Um, what about deflection? Deflection is kind of funny because this is, you know, I'd argue that this is the one problem, I don't say problem, but it's the one thing I have an issue with with the steel manual in general. Okay? The concrete spec actually lifts out deflection limits. Like it says, you will not design a structure that deflects more than this. And it actually specifies it. It's right there. The steel spec does not. Okay? If you go to chapter L of the spec, this is what it says on deflections. Deflections in structural members shall not impair the serviceability of the structure. And that's it. Not very much to go off of, is there? So, um, uh, the code does not actually specify deflection limits. Like in concrete design, we'd have deflection limits like L over 360 or L over 240 or something like that. The steel spec does not actually specify them. I wish that they did, but, but they don't. Um, uh, but a couple things. Uh, number one, deflection shall not impair the serviceability of the structure. When, when you all took concrete design and we did deflections in concrete, what did we not do to those loads? We didn't factor them. We, don't, we didn't factor them then, we don't factor them now. Deflections are not a safety concern in a, in a building. If a beam deflects a little too much, it does not mean that if you put a feather, a little bit more load on the beam that it explodes. Okay? It just means it's not performing its day-to-day -day intended function. So you do not factor loads, you only use service load. You know, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 line, just D plus L. Okay, so that's point one. Point two, just because the deflection limits are not in the manual does not mean that they are not available. One thing that I would suggest that everybody in this room do is go onto AISC's website and uh, I become a student member, okay? I'm serious about that because um, one of the things that I think AISC does right, and I'll admit, I think, I, I, I truly believe, I think they do this better than the concrete industry, is they make a lot of their design resources available online and available online for free, okay? Um, especially if you are a student, okay? To become a student member is pretty, straight, uh, pretty straightforward. And um, once you become a student member, you get access to a number of design guides. These design guides cover things that we don't really cover in class, but you may see in your career. Like, like for instance, designing for torsion. Like we don't really, we do our best to try and avoid torsion in a structural engineering setting, but sometimes it's unavoidable. We don't have time to talk about it in class, but that's where a design guide comes into play. Each one of these design guides, I want to say, is like, Somewhere between the, like twenty-five to fifty dollars, I'm really not sure, but there's like thirty of them. You get them for free, you know. So, I, I would, I would, uh, uh, I would register for these. Um, one of the common ones, are very popular ones, design guide three. Design guide three is serviceability design considerations for steel buildings, and it outlines a lot of suggested limits for deflections. You know, in the steel industry, the limits have to be agreed upon between the the owner, the architect, the engineer, etc. But there are a lot of suggestions in here. So for instance, um, these are some limits from Design Guide 3. So if you're looking at a non-plastered ceiling like this, this is a non-plastered ceiling, this is drop ceiling, this, you, know, you don't have that plaster on there. And we're talking about a floor beam, um, you know, our vertical deflection might be limited to L over 360 or 1 inch uh, or, or what have you. Um, in this case, under the, uh, the, the dead load. Uh, a number of them are also limited to live load. For instance, uh, you know, for instance, if you're talking about a roof member, it might be half the live load on the roof or the 50-year snow, whatever uh, is going to be, uh, whatever's going to be uh, 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 important, uh, or whatever's going to be, um, whatever's going to govern. I guess would be the, the, the best way of putting that. Um, sound good? But but let me let me also say, ultimately, it is uh, you know an agreement between the owner and the architect. In other words, if the owner and the architect come in and says, these beams can't deflect more than an inch under live load, well, that's what you're designing for. All right? Sound good? All right. My cleric and I looked at this one. Um, so for the purposes of what we do in here, if there are deflection limits to consider, I'm going to give them to you. Like I'm going to say live load deflection is limited to one inch or, you know, Dead load deflection is limited to this, uh, or, or et cetera. Typically, they're a function of the live load. So.
Sound good? Now, if you find that light, that deflection governs your design, then you need to be designed. Hold on for one sec. If you find that deflection governs, if you find that you know, you've designed a beam based on moment and you find, well, it's deflecting too much, then instead of going to the ZX tables, go to the IX tables. Now, I've got here a tab marking on here. I, you probably don't need to tab this since it's right behind the ZX tables. Like if you turn a couple pages, it's right, um, right next to the uh, ZX tables. Instead of organizing the shapes based on their ZX, it's organizing them based on their IX, their moment of inertia. So just like with the ZX tables, it's the same deal. Um, they're broken up into chunks, and of these chunks, the one up top that's bolted is the lightest within the group that has the, uh, the largest moment of inertia. Sound good? Okay. The reason that, that that's a good question. The reason why deflection limits are more often than not typically a function of live load is because we can usually account for dead load deflection through things like camber. So for instance, if let's say there's a floor beam supporting this this load up here and the dead weight of the floor is going to cause this beam to deflect half an inch. I can take the beam and bend it upwards one half of an inch so that when it's bent upwards a half of an inch and I put the dead load on there, it sits flat. In other words, I can usually account for dead load deflection pretty easily. Live load deflection is a whole lot, a whole lot more variable. And that's going to be uh, um, that's going to be a little tougher to account for in camber. Now think about this room. When this group leaves and the group comes in later, it's going to be a different set of loads, a different set of uh, 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 parameters. Does that make sense? What's that? You will leave after that. I, I, I appreciate your, your, your commitment to concrete and steel, though. That's cool stuff. Any questions though? This, this, this is good stuff. I really want to make sure everybody's clear on this stuff. Are we good? Okay. I think I've done enough, you know, going over a lot of the theory and, and the, 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 the spec. I think it's time to get into some, uh, some example problems. I think you're going to find that in practice, I know I've a lot of different design aids and a lot of different tables. I think you're going to find this is pretty simple. See if it's adequate. So, uh, we have a, a 16 by 31 that's subjected to a dead load of 450 pounds per foot, not including its self weight. We have a live load of 550 pounds per foot, and it's a 30 foot long beam that's simply supported. Now we're going to calculate the moment capacity. We're going to look up the shear capacity, and we're also going to check to see if this beam, uh, if this beam based on a service live load deflection limit of L over 360. So. Let's sort of get into this. Let's take it one step at a time. I think you're going to find this is, uh, this is pretty straightforward. Okay. Get all this out of the way. Oh. I need to go to this slide. All right, let's start off with some structural analysis on this beam. Now, what is the dead load on the beam? Now, what is the self weight? No? 31 pounds per foot. This one is picked. It's a W16 by 31. And a W16 by 31 weighs 31. Y'all remember this? Bringing it back, right? No, that's that's pretty much exact. 
And, and here, here's the thing. Let's say that you weren't sure. How would you find that out? You could take the area, in, the cross-sectional area in square inches, convert it into square feet, and multiply it by 490. See, remember, remember to get the self-weight of a beam, take its gamma and multiply it times its area. So you could, do, I mean, do that and tell me what you get, you know, and you should get a, about 31 pounds per foot. Oh, you can do that. You ask the question. And this is 550? All right. All right, so tell me what to do. By now, you should know what to do with dead loads and live loads. We, we do for, for moment and shear, not for deflection. Not for deflection. Yeah. Well, why don't, why don't we do this? WU equals 1.2. Oh, come on. Okay, I think this is, you can handle this. I have faith in you, Mr. Fadiga. What do we got? 1457. We'll just keep it there. 1457. Well, do we have a second, Mr. Fika? <laughs> Does anybody provide a second on this? Okay. Now, sir. Come on now. You're panicking over dead loads and live loads. I mean, I'm wondering what like a horror movie would do. Uh, all right, one point. Would it be fair to say this is 1.457 kips per foot? Uh, all right. Now, now, how do we get our factored moment? W L squared over eight. which it is. How long is it, the, the beam? All right, and what does that come out to be? Say it again. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, what about the ultimate shear? How do we calculate factored shear, the maximum shear? It's a simply supported beam. Uniformly distributed load. And what is the reaction? There we go. Now, if you didn't know that offhand, where would you look that up? Table 3 What does that come out to be? Say it again. All right. Now, before we call it, I do want you all to do something for me. So, just to make the point on shear, okay? I want you to go to the ZX tables. I want everybody to go to the ZX tables. I want you to find the W16 by 31. 
there is a possibility that it's not bolded. There's a possibility. Because we're analyzing, we're not designing. I'll tell you, it's, it's not the case, but it is bolded. It is bolded. 16 by 31. Now, now, we're going to finish this example next time, but help me out. What is the moment capacity of this beam? 203. Is this beam good for moment capacity? What is the shear capacity? So it's a shear capacity of 131 kips, and it only has 20 kips on it in shear. That just happens with steel beams a lot, that the shear capacity is just through the roof compared to the moment capacity. That just is what it is. Okay. So, so far, I mean, just looking at this, does the beam meet moment capacity? Yes. Does it meet shear capacity? Yes. What about deflections? That's where... That's where uh, next lecture comes in. We will finish this example next time, then we will learn how to design continuously braced beams. Then after that, beam buckling. That's all I got. <laughs>